Well, I was trying to do part two and my system locked up uh, and crashed. And I'm pretty ticked off about that, obviously. Uh, I didn't didn't get a chance to save anything, so I had LibreOffice open with all my notes that I was supposed to take, and I didn't save them because I didn't expect to crash. So uh, anyway, let's launch this. Oh well. Huh. Nifty, even though I didn't save that. It must have saved it for me. Okay. In the last video I forgot to touch on something. Which is a, which is another benefit to to using Linux. And this is this is universal across all distributions of Linux that are like this. It's not just Ubuntu. You do not have to defrag your computer. Okay? And to explain explain this here in this word processing window. Um, the, the the way that Windows manages files, its its file system and so on, is called NTFS. It's the new technology file system. And the way that NTFS works, this is Windows again. The way that the Windows file system works, um, I have the O file. Okay, now when I write the O file, there's the O file, and then I write the P file, and here's the P file. Okay, and then I write uh, the B file. Okay, and here's a little little teeny tiny B file. Well. Then I get rid of the P file. Okay. Let me be sure I'm recording. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then I get rid of the P file. Now I need to put all that space back in. So there's space between now the O file and the B file. And then I go and I write the C file. Well, what happens is the C file's too large to fit in the gap made by deleting the P file. So what it does. is the C file is going to write inside that gap as far as it can and then it's going to write here as far as it can. Well what happens is when I want to read the C file it takes longer to read because it has to go and, and skip. It's not contiguous in other words. Okay and you can imagine how over the, over, over the you know weeks, months, years of writing to your disk, creating and deleting files and so on, installing and uninstalling programs. You can imagine how this this, this is going to become a compounding problem. It's going to make your system very very slow. Um, just for one thing, and it's also it's also going to put more wear and tear on your disk too, because your your uh, your disk is having to do a lot more intense read write that kind of thing so the way that it works in Linux and in Linux I think we're up to ext4 now but the way that the ext works which is the, which is the the way that the, this is the Linux file system works it writes your O file okay it leaves a lot of space plenty of space it writes P and it writes C here take some of the space up between these so that I can put this all on one line hopefully so that when I go to write B B same thing it ma it makes sure to put it in in to a space where there's going to be plenty of space between something before it and something after it and then when I go and I delete to uh, say P Doesn't matter. There's still a huge gap there. That when I go and I write the G file, puts G file in there. There's a huge gap now. So it helps things remain contiguous. You don't have fragmentation. For all intents and purposes, you have zero fragmentation of your data with Linux because of the XT system versus the NTFS system that Windows uses. So you don't have to do defragging. That means that you don't have to 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 have your computer tied up where you're not using it either doing this overnight when you're asleep 
or uh, sitting and waiting or, or having it do it while you're eating dinner or whatever. You're not losing productivity. You're not having to, you know, having to fool with the hassle of defragging your computer in Linux the way that you have to defrag your computer in, in Windows. You don't have fragmentation. That means no defragging. So that's one plus that I meant to hit on and even had it there in the document and I forgot to talk about it. So we've done that. We talked about that. Now we're going to move on to other things. I'm going to get rid of this because I had again my system crashed, restarted itself, and all that jazz. So let me get rid of that again. Okay, so what all did I have open before the, the daggone thing crashed? I think I had that open too. I think I had a terminal window open also. So one of the first things you're going to notice is you have this bar up here. It's called the panel. And then you have this bar along the left, which is called the, 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 the launcher. Let me check my terminology. I don't know where I can go. Yeah, that's called the launcher there to the left. And again, I can choose to auto-hide it, which is what I usually do, but for, for the purposes of what we're doing, teaching you, um, I had to use everything. And also trying to keep it looking as much like it will when you first install the system as I can. I'm going to not have that hidden. Let me put this back through here. Uh, so you, you would think at first glance, when you're new to this, you're going to think, well, uh, this must be analogous to the start button. It's not. You would think that, but it's not. And the reason why you would probably think that, the reason why I think I, I thought that when I first installed the system was because that's where your username and all of that is. Now, I think they've changed this, and the name's not actually there. I think that's a, a setting that I actually changed to put the name back. But regardless of that, you're going to probably go to a corner, and you're probably going to think that, well, this, this must be the start this must be the start menu because this must be analogous to Windows taskbar, right? I mean, it's got to be. This is your indicator. This is where your clock would be and all of that. And then you'd have your your your, your quick launch icons and everything here. So th this must be this must be a, it's not. Uh, this is where you you would go to log out, shut down, that kind of thing. This is also where you can find out um, the details about your system. You know how much memory you have, that kind of thing. What version of Ubuntu you're running. Uh, this is also where you can go to get to your all of your system settings. You, know, you can change your desktop background and so on with, through there. Your brightness and lock settings. That's more if you're using a laptop. You can change there. Um, power settings. You know when you, when your screen cuts off, that kind of thing would go there and so on. Time and date settings. Uh, that's another thing. I can just bring that up and I can change that just to show you that um, you don't have seconds. Um, when the system is is fresh, you know, when you first started off, that's not the way that it looks in terms of having seconds ticking off. That's something that you can choose to do, and that's always something I choose to have enabled. So anyway, uh, you can get to all your all all of your system settings through there. But that's not the start button. That's not where you get to your programs and so on. Um, the way that you actually would get to your programs is you have the launcher across the left here is through here this is analogous to the start button in in ubuntu this is called the dash okay this and and this desktop environment what a desktop environment is and this is one of the things that i need to bring um, firefox up again for uh, and i'm going to type in kde just to show you a different desktop environment from, from Unity. Um, my name is, there we go. Let's just use this. This picture right here is a good one. It's from Wikipedia, so it should be pretty safe. So anyway, here is the KDE desktop environment. This is another desktop environment that you can choose to have with Linux. If you choose to have the KDE desktop in Ubuntu, uh, you're going to end up being in Kubuntu, K for KDE, and Ubuntu, or Ubuntu, f f obviously Ubuntu, that's where that comes from, so it's just a kind of a portmanteau sort of a deal. Um, so th what a desktop environment is, is it's the overall look of the desktop. It's, it's, it's the fact that you, down here you have something that looks 
very similar to Windows. If you if you go from Windows, the, the Windows desktop environment, to the KDE desktop environment and the Linux distribution, this is going to be very similar, much more similar than what you see here in Unity. Unity is probably going to look drastically different to you if you're going from Windows to, to Ubuntu. KDE looks much more similar. This is analogous to here, this big K thing there. That's analogous to your start button. And you can see you have your, your favorites list here. That's where you're going to want to put programs that you use a lot. You have applications, which is, is, is analogous to all programs in Windows. Um, computer will take you to, to your different devices, your drives and things like that and so forth. Leave would be where you would find your login and or your logout options and your and lock option, that kind of thing. But you can see that this is just a, this is just another desktop environment. So that that's explaining again what a desktop environment is. Okay. So this is KDE, that's one desktop environment. The desktop environment that we're in with Ubuntu is called Unity. Specifically, it's Unity 7. Unity 8 will be coming along in a, in, a, in, a, in another in another release or two of Ubuntu, so it'll be in maybe in 15.10, probably definitely by 16.04. Now to explain what that means, so, so again, let's go back to our system settings. What version are we in? Uh, we go to details, which is the same thing as going to about this computer up here. And we see it's Ubuntu 15.04. Well, what is this? What does this signify? How does this work? This is simple. Okay, 15 is the is the version. This is version 15. It's the 15th release of Ubuntu. 04 for April. That's the month of the year when it's released. Everything Ubuntu is going to be either an 04, a dot 04, or a dot 110. What is dot one ten? If 04 is April, dot one ten is going to be what? It's going to be October. Everything Ubuntu, the the, the 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 version, the new version is either going to be released in April or it's going to be released in October. Usually at the end of the month. In fact, I think probably always at the end of the month. So, uh, what's the next version going to be of Ubuntu? Fifteen dot ten. Okay, and they also have cute little names. For example, this is uh, what is this? Viv Vivid Vervet, I believe is how you sp you spell it. Or did I spell it wrong? Or it just doesn't know. I think what it is is it doesn't uh, recognize that word because it's kind of obscure. So let's go to about this computer. Should have it. No, it doesn't have it there. Oh well, just take my word for it. I think it's Vivid Vervet. Yeah, because the last one was Utopic Unicorn. Now we're in Vivid Vervet. I don't know. T U V W. I don't know what W is going to be. Um, I mean, we already had one. I think the first release of Ubuntu, weirdly enough, was Wordy Warthog. So I don't know what they're going to use for W since they've already had a W before they started doing them in alphabetical order and so on. Anyway, then you could also see too that it's always. Uh, alliteration there, vivid, vervet. It's always an animal. It's always an animal. So, 1504, that's, yeah, 15.10. So, at some point, either in 15.10, which will be released in October, or 16.04, which will be released next April, a year from now, uh, you will have the Unity 8 desktop environment. But for right now, it's Unity 7. That's this desktop environment that you're looking at right here. This is the panel up at the top. Just to kind of recap that, I th I, again, I was doing one video, it crashed, and I lost all of that, and so I can't remember if I've touched on it in this one or not. So this is the panel up at the top here, and this is the the dash here. And this dash is going to be analogous to the start button in Windows. It's a very powerful feature, the way that it's done in Ubuntu. Um, I would actually say it's probably much more powerful than many of the other desktop environments in Linux and certainly more powerful than the way that Windows does things. So there's a couple of ways to get into that and uh, in, get into this. I can either go you with the mouse, go up here and click on it. The other thing I can do is I can hit the Windows key on my keyboard and that brings it up. Now I can search my computer and I can search online sources and so on in here. You can see it's pulling music files 
from my music folder or where is it searching you see the little icon here that's home well this is my file manager which in, in Ubuntu is called um, Nautilus uh, so this is my file manager. Remember, in when, if you go back and you watch the Windows video, where I explain, you know, skills you need for you know, the beginning with Windows video. You remember I explained about what a file manager is, and in Windows it's called Explorer. Well, here in Ubuntu it's called uh, Nautilus. There are myriad um, file managers that you will see in. Linux and you can put these other file managers into any distribution of Linux so you can have more than one file manager and they all look a little different do things a little bit differently but the main feature is it's a it's a graphical way for you to interact with your files to to move them from one folder to another to to create a new file you, you to see the icon there and so on and not have to do it through command line where you would go in Linux I think it's like CD and then you have to type in the directory so it would be jack forward slash home forward slash music forward slash Gordon Gordon hyphen Lightfoot uh, or actually I guess it would be actually Gordon Lightfoot and then it would be, you know, uh, sundown.mp4, and you would hit enter, and that would launch the file. You know, or, or you would go to, just go and open that, and then you would enter in a command. So you would hit enter, and it would, that would actually open the file, not in something graphical, but in, here in your terminal. And then you enter a command. It, that's a real cumbersome way of doing it, so why do we have file managers? So we don't have to do that nonsense. Um, so this is your file manager, and you have, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, so this is Nautilus. You have Dolphin and KDE as the default. Nemo is another one that I think is used in, um, which one uses Nemo as default? Is it is it uh, LXDE or is it XFCE? But it, one of them, uh, so there's all kinds of, uh, so uh, Dolphin, uh, Nautilus, Nemo, uh, whoa, I can't even remember all of them. But there's 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 numerous different ones, and this is just the one that is used in Ubuntu is is Nautilus. So when I open my dash up and I see the home little home icon there, where is it searching? It's searching here. This is home. See up here at the top left, home. Okay, now there's subsets of home. There's pictures, music. These are the default folders. You see, I've created some on my own. I've created another pictures folder. You can't do this in Windows. Um, you see, I have two two that are named the same thing in Linux because again, this is the way that the kernel works. It differentiates between capital and and not capital. So I can have two folders named the same thing, and as long as I capitalize one and the other is not capitalized, at least not all of it. It recognizes them as two different folders. Windows, I don't think you can do that. In fact, I'm almost, again, this is another thing I'm almost 100% certain about. You can't do that in Windows. Uh, another thing, too, is I can actually have a document, um, two instances of a document open. So let me let me actually save this. So I'm going to go to File, Save As. I'm going to save it in my home folder. Jack is also my home folder. Okay. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to choose the file format again, because let's say I want this to be compatible with uh, Office, you know, or Microsoft Office, Microsoft Office Word specifically, for somebody using Microsoft Office on a Windows computer. So I'm going to say, okay, I want this to be doc docx, and I'm going to title this uh, "Beginning with Linux Notes." Okay, so I'm going to save this. And it prompts you saying, "Are you sure? Because this may and it may not be safe. Da -da -da. Doesn't matter." And I'll leave that. I'm gonna tell it to save in the Dagon format. I told it to save in. Now watch. I'm gonna go back to our file manager. Uh, the other thing too is I just did this. Um, let me. You see how you have the icon here for or the launcher icon for the file manager and you see this little arrow off to the left here that means that there's a window of that open uh, I can click that and I can open it that's just a single left click I can click that and open it I can click it to close it the other thing I can do is I can with the scroll 
button on my mouse. I can just scroll and that will also do the same thing and it'll, it, will, it will open it. And I, so I can scroll here, scroll, scroll, scroll. So you can left click, you can use the scroll, it doesn't matter. Um, so let me come back here and you see beginning with Linux notes dot doc dot or excuse me dot doc x. So when I open two instances of this, okay, because I need to be able to show you. So I have two instances opened. I'm going to move this and I'm going to put that split screen split screen there. And I'm going to go to the other instance of this. Did it not open the other instance of this? I guess it didn't. It should have. Hmm. Maybe it is going to be stubborn. Well, what I can do is I can open it in what G edit. At least I think I can. Okay, well, this is all Cody, Cody BS, but anyway, let's try, maybe not doc it, or uh, not G-edit, but, um, uh, what do we have, WordPad will work, I think. What I'm trying to show you, if I'm able to, is that another big difference between the way that Linux does things, and this is a, this is a function of the, the kernel, not the operating system, okay? So in other words, this is going to be like this in any Linux operating system, because they're all running what? They're all running on the Linux kernel, and this is a function of the kernel. And it may not work. It probably won't. Anyway, I can have a file open I can be used in other words I can be using a file and I can also edit the file on the other hand and save that while this file is open Windows won't let you do that if you try if you had a if you had a file opened and you tried to edit that file when it's opened again somewhere so I have the same document open twice Windows won't let you save those changes because it says, hey, hey, we've got this opened over here. We, 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 we what do you, what do you, we, we're not going to do that. What are you doing? We're not going to do that. In in Linux, you can you can edit an open file. Uh, let me show you this. Actually, this is probably a, a better better example anyway. So I have this file this this file open. Now watch. This is another thing you cannot do in Windows, but you can do it in Linux. This file is open right here, you see? It's open. This is an open file. Look up here in the title bar. Beginning with Linux Notes dot docx. See that? Watch. I'm gonna get rid of that file name and I'm gonna type something silly just to be silly. My name is Bob and I hit enter it let me do it. Now in Windows, if you tried to do that, if you tried to edit the file name of an open file, it would spit at you. No, we're not going to do it. You'd hear, you'd, you'd hear this sound, you'd hear DONG! And an exclamation point and hold down, hold down yards and would tell you we're not going to do it. Well, in Linux you can't because this is a function of the kernel. The kernel allows you to do little things like this. And when I come up here, what does it say? It says, still says the same thing, beginning with Linux notes dot doc x. Okay, so I can edit a file name while that file is still open over here. Now, what I'm curious about is can I go, yep, sure enough, save as, beginning with Linux notes, be sure I shave it, save it, shave it, save it as .docx in the same location, a home folder, which is Jack, it's the home folder, same thing, and I click save. And again, I say this. The file has been changed since it was opened for editing in LibreOffice. Saving your version of the document will overwrite changes made by others. Do you want to say yes? And you see, now I have two of them.
Now, the same thing is going to be in both of those files. Let me get rid of this. Move it to trash. And that's a that's a right click, by the way, to get to those. Same as in Windows. Same as in Windows. If I want to delete something, I'm going to hit right click and I'm going to go move to trash. That that part of it works the same as in Windows. Um, but again, that's a skill you should remember from watching the beginning of Windows video. So anyway, that's uh, a, a nifty little thing. Now what I was showing you before is that this is searching in Home, so it's going to search in here, which is my Home folder. This is also, you'll see, as you just saw when I was saving that, it also is Jack. Okay, so Home and Jack are the same thing. I might get a little confusing for some people, but just understand it's the same. Um, if I if I actually I can show you I think somewhere psh, computer. This is my main file system. Okay, this is going up the tree, and you see home, and you see Jack. Now you understand why Jack and home are the same thing. Okay, there's nothing but Jack in the home folder, and so it defaults. That's why. Anyway, so when I open up, let me minimize all this nonsense here. When I open up um, the the dash here with one single left click, the default is going to be to search in my home folder. If I go over here, just to the right of that, this is where I find my programs. And you see, I can see, you know, see all of them here, and, or I can see just the top row. So these are all of them, and I have to scroll down and do the whole thing. Now, if I know what I'm looking for, so let's say I'm looking for Firefox, and there she is. There's Firefox. So I can type up here, and I can search, and I can find the, find the programs that way, or I can just scroll down, hit here scroll down and see them all. I can do that. Now, let's say I want to remove this launcher. So let me let me uh, unlock from the launcher. This is a this is again this is a, this is a right click. And I'm going to unlock this from the launcher. Now it still shows up because the program is still open. And you see it disappeared there. So I want to put that back. I want to add a launcher. In other words, I've just shown you how to remove a launcher, but I want to show you how to add a launcher. So I want to go up to the dash. I want to open the dash. Well, there's, I can give a single left click, but I always believe in showing you more than one way of doing things if I know more than one way of doing things. So I can also hit the start button on my keyboard. Get the start button on my keyboard. I'm not saying hit the start button on your computer. Some keyboards have a button that's a start button. It may even have the little Windows logo on it. So you're going to hit the Start button on your keyboard. That opens it up. I can hit uh, Tab. Well, Tab should have worked. But uh, anyway, you can give a left click there. There we go. Now we're going to be searching in our uh, in our programs for Firefox. I don't even need to type the whole thing in. I can just type in Fire. Or I can do Fi. And it gives me everything with FI. But anyway, Firefox. Type in the whole thing. Now I can either launch the program by right clicking it and hitting launch. And if I go left and right, it will scroll through the programs. Let me hit escape and get out of that. The easiest way and the most common way you're going to want to probably do this is just by giving a single left click to that icon. And now it launches. Now that the program has launched, Put it up here where you can see it. Now that the program has launched. Now when you move them like that, they will want to lock. They'll want to lock to the launcher. But I'm only putting it up back up here so, I can, so you can see it. Now, uh, now you see it's unlocked because I unlocked it when it was still open. I can lock it, lock it to the launcher that way once the program has has opened. That's one way of putting one of these launchers here in the launcher. Let me close out of that. Let me get rid of this again. What's the other way? Go back to all my programs. You can see it still has my search term there. Let's say it doesn't. Whether it does or doesn't make any difference. 
doesn't make any difference. This technique works the same either way. When you see the icon, again, whether, you, whether you've scrolled down to find it or you've typed it in, um, the other thing you can do is you don't need to launch the program. You can click and drag and you can plunk it wherever you want it. And now it's locked to the launcher can unlock it again if you choose. So that's how that works. That's pretty straightforward. You have, it will search your files and folders along with showing you your devices. It'll search your videos in this one. It'll search songs and things in this one, pictures in this one, and social networking messages and things in that one. If you have it linked to your social networking accounts and so on, which I don't, that's why it's giving me this error message. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward as far, as far as all that goes. The other thing, and this is what crashed my computer before, so I'm not going to do this again, but you have these things that are called scopes, and you can choose which scopes you want here. I think weather may actually be safe to use. I was trying to search a Wikipedia page, and it just it didn't want to do that. So weather will work. So there's a scope here, and what you'll, what you'll do is you, you'll add scopes for whatever you would like to search up here, this fetches things from all online. This is searching searching things on the internet. So you can add whatever you want. You can add Yahoo Finance, Wikipedia, or whatever. I'm adding weather. Okay, I've clicked weather. Now what I will do is I will come up here and I will do weather colon. Weather defines what scope you're wanting to use. The colon separates it so that everything after is the search term. And I believe you enter in your zip code 24122 and I have to pray that this doesn't crash my computer. Okay, it won't do it. So whether Montvale, Virginia. And I hit enter and it brings it up in my default browser which is Chrome. and it gives me the weather. So I can search from in here. It does give me um, information in here too. So if I don't hit enter and I just click on one of those uh, icons, it will give me information that way too and I can hit 10 day forecast and then it wants to open up the browser again. But the point that I'm showing you here is how to use the scopes feature. You enter in which scope you want to use, colon, followed by the search term that you want, are wanting to search. So if I wanted to search, uh, I don't want to do this too much because I don't know if my um, video card can handle that. Uh, so I don't really want to do too much with this because it could lock it up and I'll lose everything that I've just done. A whole, you know, half an hour video will, will get lost. But you get the point, okay, of how to use scopes. Now, there's also something called the HUD. And the HUD is different. It's going to pop up up here in the same general location, but the HUD is not the dash. So don't get them confused. I have my program open. Let's say I don't know all of the... Um, commands in a program or I want to do things lightning fast because it will, it, ha it serves both both uh, both functions. I'm going to hit the alt key on my keyboard and this pops up. Now you'll notice I hit alt again to close it out. You see how this icon up here where, where this pops up that's for the dash. Where, where Why does it change? It changes because it's showing you what program you're using the HUD in it's this program that you're in right now. So it pops this up and it says, hey, we're doing this in LibreOffice. This is what you're doing. So the, uh, so I'm going to say, um, I, I don't know how to save. And so it says right here what comes up. Save as template. Save as, you know, just regular save as. Save as copy. But what's in parentheses here is the steps you use in your file menu to perform that function. It's, it, it's saying literally, okay, this, you know, save as template, save as, save as a copy. 
is here. So you're going to go File, Templates, and then you'll see Save as Template. You'll go to File, and you'll see Save As. You'll go to File, you'll see Save as a, you know, save a Copy. So this is giving you how you get to that command also here in parentheses. As well as I can just click down and you see I'm just using my arrow keys. I'm not using my mouse now. I could use my mouse. I mean I can use my mouse, my mouse cursor to do it too. I just I feel like the, what makes this fast and what makes this a powerful feature is it eliminates some of the mouse usage. It, may, it makes it much much quicker. So I can go save as and I can hit enter this pops up and I can enter my file name this way and then I can do tab 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 and you see without even needing to use the mouse when it highlights all formats here and you see the orange border around it you'll hit the down arrow until you find the file format that you want to use which in our case was docx you hit tab you don't want to save with a password and you want to hit tab again and you see the save button highlights and you hit enter and it saves it. Now even if you know I'm going to change the view of this because I want, it, want this to be clear what I'm doing. Even if you know the command I mean, again, that's a good way of finding the command if you have a vague idea of what the command might be and you don't know where to find it. Because again, you're using a new operating system and you're using new software along with it because you're having to use free software alternatives. So even if you know the command and you're not searching for the command, it's still a useful, a useful tool to have. The HUD, I mean. Let's get a drink of water here. Um, why? It's fast. Um, if you were writing a paper or a book or whatever and you're in this program in specific having to ch constantly change uh, formats and alignments and things for eight hours a day and go up here to this ribbon to select stuff is going to get incredibly cumbersome it's going it, to it it'll actually get I hate I, I, I hate to use this word this way because some people might not understand but fatiguing you'll actually get fatigued by it and and what that means is is that it it's going to put a lot of strain on your on your hands and so on carpal tunnels and and that kind of thing because of the amount of physical interaction you have to engage in with the mouse and the keyboard and all of that it's it's much more um it's just much more cumbersome to do to constantly have to come I mean, if your mouse is here and you're you're editing and you're you're, you're you know, selecting where and where you're wanting to type and so on, and then you have to come up here and you have to change. Okay, well now I want it to be aligned right, or whatever. That's going to take time. You're moving the mouse around a lot. It's it's there's an easier way to do it. So I'm down here and I type Jack. Now first off, let me um, uh, put me back in for veranda here. I prefer that font. I certainly prefer prefer it to a serif font. It's going to be hard for people to read on uh, a video, you know, on a computer screen in general. Oh, let's be scrolling on here, and there's veranda, and we're going to keep it to I guess 12. So anyway, so I type in, and I think we are going to go. A little bit larger than that, so just to make it easier to come on, just to make it easier for people to see. That's a little bit better. So do Jack Spratt. Well, now I want what I do next to be centered. I'm going to hit Alt, which brings up my HUD, and I'm going to do centered. And again, it shows me in parentheses how to get to that in the file menu. So I'm going to go up to, if I wanted to do it through file menu, I'm going to go up to format. Okay. I'm going to go to alignment. I'm going to do that. I can also do it here on the ribbon. Center horizontally and so on. But again, I don't want to be doing that much mouse work as I'm having to do this. So I'm going to go back and put my thing here. My cursor, my cursor, not a thing my cursor, hit alt, and I'm going to do center. 
and do format alignment. I'm going to hit centered, and it's going to pull it over there. Okay, now theoretically, Control Z, if you hit that, will undo it. So I want the next thing that I write to be centered. So I'm going to hit Alt, and I do center. I hit that, and then I do Mary had a little lamb. And then I hit enter. And I'll hit enter again to go down. And then I hit alt, which takes me into my HUD. And I do right. And it's going to be aligning it right. And I do whose fleece was white as snow. Now, do you not see, and this is a matter of personal opinion, maybe this won't be faster for you. But do, but do you not see how that's going to be faster than having to go up here and, and use the mouse to interact with everything? All you have to do is hit the Alt key, type in a command, and hit Enter. Rather, you never have to touch the mouse. You don't even have to touch any arrow keys. You don't have to hit you know any of that nonsense to go and do what you need to do. It's just Alt, type in the command, and hit Enter. Very, very, very easy very easy. In Windows, if I'm not mistaken, if you hit Alt, you would end up here up, up here at the file menu and then you would have to hit uh, either, I think it's tab or arrow keys, that kind of thing and you'd have to tab around and it would go, you know, if you hit tab, it would go to file and then if you hit uh, tab again, it, or, or the arrow keys I guess, it would go down and you'd have to, ta to hit arrow key, arrow key, arrow key, arrow key, arrow key until you got down here and then you'd have to hit enter. You, no, this is much faster than that. It's Alt, same as I guess it would be in Windows, If I, again, if memory serves. And rather than hitting arrow keys and doing all that nonsense, it's just type the command. Type the command. Hit Enter, and it does it. Very, very fast. I'm going to get rid of all this nonsense now. Okay, so that's how you use the HUD. That's an incredibly powerful feature. Um, there's, and again, there, that, there's all kinds of applications for that, and that's going to change um, what HUD commands are available and so on. Change depending on, I mean, if I hit this, and and I'm in my my uh, my task man, well, not task manager, I guess it's, that's what it would be called in uh, Windows, but system monitor, and I hit here, and I can just search alphabetically to find out what commands there are. Okay, so I hit A, I get an about, that takes me to the about command, that'll give me the version of, of the software and so on. Um, B, uh, there's nothing there, C, D, E, F, G, or I'm going to hit G, H, I, J, you know, and it's just, yeah, I'm just punching now. So, you can also f learn commands that way and see where they are. That's a huge. That's a hugely useful feature. Um, but you, as you can see too, it, it, what commands there are available in HUD change depending on what there would be up here available to do in the program. Um, just like here, what's available here changes depending on the state of certain programs. If I have my browser window open here in Firefox and I right click on that, uh, I guess I should be clear that some things are right click, some things are left click. Left click would launch it, left click would minimize it. Left click, it's just a single left click, left click. If this, were, if this weren't already launched, you know, if the program weren't open and I were to left click, it would, it would launch it. Single left click. If it's launched, a single left click minimizes it. And you can see here this little arrow <coughs> means that that program is opened but minimized. A left click and you see the arrow to the right there. That means that's the window that's in focus. That's what you're in right now. Um, you can also just scroll. Will If you hover the mouse over it and you hit the, you just scroll the scroll button on your mouse will also do it. 
take it back into focus. So anyway, if I have this open, you'll see certain things show up when I just right click. Again, a single light, a single right click. There's no such thing as a, a, a double right click. So a single right click is it gives me this this uh, menu here. When the program's opened, and when the program is closed, it will sometimes look a little bit different. Again, this depends on the program as to what may change in terms of state. For example, if I had Skype and I took my Skype icon away, and so how do we get to Skype? Well, we go into our alt programs here and we type in Skype. Skype and we just drag and we'll drop that right to where right there. If I were running Skype right now, and I were in a call, and I were to right click, I would have options to end calls. If I were in a call, I would have an option like to end, end, end the call, and that kind of thing. So, de depending on the state of the program, that right click menu here on the launcher will, will, will change. Um, so that, that's another thing to kind of be aware of. Um, If you want to change your desktop background, this is very similar to how it is in Windows. You can either navigate to a picture that you have, uh, and you would be navigating to that through your, your file manager here. Um, but if you want to change like your system, you, you know, first off, let me finish my thought before. You would navigate to the file you would right click and then you would do you would have an option over a photo set as wallpaper that's what you would do but if I wanted to change the wallpaper through here I can either do change desktop background or and I'll, I'll go ahead and do that and you see it brings up appearance under all settings this is all settings appearance this is kind of a treed view is, is, is how that works this is your headings so it's all settings appearance it brings this this window up. Well, what can I do? I can either come in here, go to all programs, be sure I don't have any search terms entered, scroll down to system settings, give a left click, and open it up that way. I can come up here to the top right hand of the screen I can give a single left click and I can do system settings that way but where am I going to go I want to go to appearance and then I get my desktop backgrounds here that are native I can look at my pictures folder I could do a solid color what I want to do is I'm going to select this now here's the other thing too. Do you see how the color of your launcher changes? The color of your launcher is going to blend with the color of the background. I like that. Some people may hate it. I personally think that's brilliant. Um, but the default, and I'm going to switch back to the default. The default is the is is this. I can also change the icon size of the launchers. So you see launcher icon size there. I can change that. Right now it's 48 pixels. The 48 just refers to the pixels. I can change that. I can bring it down all the way to 16, but they're real tiny. And then, of course, I can go to the opposite extreme and I can go to 64, and then they're gigantic, and I don't like that. Um, 48, the default, is going to be about right for most people. Um, if you're adding in a ton, I mean, if you're wanting to add in every single program that you've got into your launcher, um, you may want to go lower than that, but that 48 is probably going to be right for, for for most people. And then the other thing too that I can do is I can the, the theme. All that refers to is the colors of your borders here. So I'm, I've got ambience and I've got radiance, and that just that that becomes white. Um, and 
and I, I'm going to leave it on ambience. Ambience, obviously, as you see in parentheses, is the default. So I'm, I'm going to just leave it there. Um, I had had a different. I, this was the picture I had been using. We can use that there. We could, we, you know, let's, why not? Let's just do, do that. I'll leave it default. One of the other things too about Linux is they have a lot of really beautiful desktop backgrounds. I, I, all of the Linux distributions have really um, beautiful desktop backgrounds, and the the desktop environments that go with have really beautiful desktop environments. Again, we're using Unity 7 and here in Ubuntu, but you know if you were using KDE, whether that's uh, KDE in Arch or KDE in um, uh, in Ubuntu via Kubuntu or Linux Mint KDE doesn't matter KDE has really beautiful desktop uh, backgrounds GNOME has really beautiful desktop backgrounds Cinnamon has really beautiful desktop backgrounds uh, LX uh, well uh, uh, LXDE is all, always really really basic so I wouldn't call theirs beautiful but um, most of them, are. I mean, like yeah, XFCE has some really good ones, I think. Um, you know, and and obviously, like I said, you can add your own too. You can, you know, go 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 to the internet and right click on an image. So if I if I go here and and I Google um, P51, I want a picture of a Mustang. And I can go to images in Google, and I go to search tools. And I go to size, and I, I happen to know that my desktop resolution is uh, 19, uh, 1920 by 1200, I believe it is. So do exactly 1920 by 1200, and I hit go. This will give me a desktop resol desktop uh, background that's exactly the resolution of my um, my computer. Uh, so then it's just a question of finding a picture that I like, um, which, uh, why not? View image. Magnify. And I would right click and I would do set as desktop background. Or, um, I could do save image as. I'm going to do Jack. I'm going to save it in my home folder. Again, Jack and home folder are basically synonymous. I'll leave the file name as it is and I'll hit save. So what's the other thing I can do? I can open my file manager up here, single left click, there's the picture, right click, set as wallpaper. What else can I do? I can go back to my system settings, which in this case I'm getting to through right click change background, or change desktop background I guess. And I can is it going to be in my pictures folder? No, because I didn't put it in my pictures folder. Is it going to be in under colors and gradients? Absolutely not, because that's just solid colors that I can I can uh, choose from here. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be under colors and gradients. It's let me go back to the picture that I had been using. It'll be under there. Where's it going to be? It's going to be here. I'm going to hit the plus arrow. I'm going to navigate here in my in my file manager. <coughs> To wherever I put it, which in this case was home. I'm going to find the picture. There it is. And I'm going to hit open. And there it is. You see? So, there's numerous ways, and I'm going to switch back to what I had been using before. So, there's numerous ways of doing that, changing your, your desktop wallpaper. As far as your settings go, now I this isn't defaulted this way, but I have the system settings um, also pinned to the launcher. Um, I don't need to get into too much of this because I'm I'm already almost an hour in, and there's still plenty that I need to show you. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much of the customizing and things like that that you can do. Those are things that are pretty intuitive. You'll be able to find it, find how to do that all on your own. I'm going to get into more core, um, sort of core uh, skills that you're going to need to be effective um, at using Linux, at, at least as far as as far as using Ubuntu and other um, forks of Ubuntu. 
like Linux Mint, Kubuntu, um, Zubuntu, and so on. And also by extension because it's using the app to get you know package repositories and, and structure and all that. Also, you'll be able to use uh, effectively use anything that is Debian based too. So again, you go back to the tree. Let's open that up. Google Linux distro tree and uh, we click here and we view the image. D D D D D D D. Okay, so move your tree. Well, that's just Red Hat. That's not even. That's not even the whole shebang. Uh, Debian distro tree. Oh, fine. We'll go back to Wikipedia then. We'll pull it from here. Okay. So, let's go back down. See, here's Debian. Okay, now remember, here's Ubuntu, which is a fork of what? Debian. So not only are you going to be able to use all of these myriad distros that have sprung, I mean, here they are, all of these, and, and you see how these are actually forks of Kubuntu, so you have all these. Um, not only are you going to be able to use all of these if you can use Ubuntu, but as far as the package structure and all of that goes, and you know, sudo apt-get, you know, it uses aptitude, you're going to be able to use Debian, but you're also going to be able to use any of these other myriad offshoots, forks, whatever you want to call them, of Debian. So you can see you're, you're going to you're going to you're going to be able to use a massive universe of um, of uh, operating systems and software and so on if you know the skills that I'm getting ready to teach you coming up here in the next minute or two. The, uh, when I get to Arch. The same thing is going to apply. And Arch was down here somewhere. The same kind of thing is going to apply. Arch is a more challenging um, distribution, I think personally. But the same thing is going to apply that you, that you're going to have you're going to be able to use a myriad here too, although not as great of a myriad. Uh, I'm not going to get into Red Hat or anything like that. Um, I tried using Red Hat once, and I found that it was uh, that it was not very easy at all for me to get um, uh, drivers installed from for, for my wireless. Which obviously, if you can't install drivers for your wireless, you can't pull any packages or anything up and configure the system and so on. So I kind of just abandoned that. Um, but any, anyway, so we're, we're going to start getting into into some skills now more than more than customization. Okay, so we have this open. This is your terminal. You're going to learn some terminal commands now, kiddies. So here's your terminal. We're going to open up Firefox again. So <clears throat> you do not have to use the terminal all the time necessarily. All right. So we go into system settings. Let's let's open system settings up again. Uh you can, if you want to, for example, check for updates to your system. You know, check for system updates. You're going to go to Software Updater, okay, and you're going to give a left click to that, and it'll do what I'm getting ready to show you how to do in the um, in the uh, uh, terminal. But again, if I know more than one way, one way of doing something, I always show people more than one way of doing something. And you will need to use the terminal some. So it's checking for software updates and so forth. And it doesn't find anything. Now, you go back into your terminal here. Sudo. Apt, which 
is telling it to go to aptitude. Now I think if I have aptitude installed, sudo aptitude update. Now let's see what this does. Yeah, you can do aptitude. You you remove the get. You don't do apt get. You do aptitude update. Um, and I don't want to confuse people, but some have some people feel like aptitude itself, not apt, but aptitude, is a little bit more intelligent about how it upgrades things. You're less likely to end up with breakages and so on that could affect the stability of your system. Um, so some people have have a, have a preference between apt get and aptitude, but that's one command would be pseudo, pseudo aptitude update, which also would be you know if you wanted to upgrade after it's searched for up, uh, updates, uh, it compares the software on your computer with the software that's available on the main server, and it says okay, um, at you know okay there's there's a there's a change that can be made. You, you can you can do you can do an upgrade. You can get some new software. There's new software available. So if I wanted to do that, how would I do it? I would do sudo uh, aptitude. If I can spell it, sudo aptitude upgrade. And now that it's compared the list when it does the updates, it will it would now give, show me what upgrades are available. And it says that there's not any. Now that's one way of doing it. Most commonly, what you're going to see in people instructing you to do online as you're searching for, for programs and so on, it's not going to be tell, telling you to do aptitude. It's going to tell you to do apt-get. So that's what I'm going to be teaching you. There is another alternative that you can do. I'm going to be teaching you apt-get. So it's sudo apt-get update. Now pay attention to these commands, and you may want to write them down if you're wanting to use Linux. Um, so that you have them at hand. So that's sudo apt get update, sudo apt get upgrade. Okay, and I'm not going to hit enter again. I'm not going to continue to do this because it's just going to take time. So it's always sudo, which tells tells the system that you're wanting to act as a root user, basically. Sudo apt get is saying okay I want aptitude to perform a function apt get and you're saying update upgrade install I didn't spell that right but nonetheless that's going to install a program followed by the program name here where I just typed a bunch of nonsense that kind of thing now I'm going to go to God, Ubuntu com. I think it's dot com. It may be co dot uk. Uh, yeah, it's going to be. It's different because it's a UK domain, and I don't remember what it is. Yeah, dot co dot uk. Anyway, let's see if there's any. Let's see if there's any um, software that I might want to add. This is this is another good resource. This is, the other thing too, real quick. Um, the other thing you need to understand is that when you're talking about proprietary software, when you're talking about Windows, for example. <clears throat> there's no real community or anything there. In free software, particularly with Linux, again, no matter what distribution you use, there's a there's a whole big community. And you can go to the community, it's online, there's forums and so on. You go to the community and you can you can post and you can ask a question, how do I do such and such? Or I'm having such and such problem what do I do? And people in the community, and again, it's global. There's a whole big global community. It's millions and millions of people. The community will answer your questions and help you out and guide you and walk you through. Because the fact is, everybody that uses Linux wants more people to use Linux. Because it's better for all of them the more people that use it. Okay, that's basically kind of how, how it works. Um, so I, I've had nothing but positive experiences as far as the Linux community and all that goes. And that also means, though, that you're going to be going to online web pages and things like that, looking for information, looking for news, that kind of thing, you know, all of that. And this is a good, this is a good resource. It's a good um, website for news about specifically 
the Ubuntu distribution of Linux. So if you're wanting to use Ubuntu, this might be a, a, a page worth bookmarking in your browser so that you can continue to get updates to, um, you know, updates on upcoming releases of Ubuntu, issues in Ubuntu, but also, and this is what I'm looking for, software that you may want to put on your installation of the Ubuntu operating system. So, that might be one worth looking at. So you right click and then you step into a new tab. This might be one I might want to add just, just, just as an example. Some of these are going back kind of far. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. VLC is one I don't think I have yet that I could also show you. Let me go back up here, be sure I don't have that in my software. So you're going to scroll down to V. And sure enough, I don't see VLC. Okay, so sometimes he gives recommendations about software to add that will improve your experience here. player okay this is going to be a good one to show you so in and this is another this is another set of terminal commands and so on that you're going to want I'm just going to shrink this window down for a second to get it kind of out of the way I'm still going to want to be able to see it here in a minute once I get done explaining what I'm getting ready to do <coughs> in Ubuntu and this is specific to Ubuntu and all of the forks that it has given birth to all the other distributions and I've showed you the tree I've showed you it several times in this video I showed it to you several times in the last video uh, that big that big tree of all of the offshoots of Ubuntu so what you know if you're using Kubuntu if you're using Mint if you're using Lubuntu Zubuntu it doesn't matter it doesn't matter Ubuntu and everything that is sprung from it has the ability to do what's called a PPA this is unique in the Linux world it's incredibly easy and simple to use it's incredibly easy and simple to do I love this feature and I wish that something like it if not this exact same thing existed in other platforms like for example what I use in my other computer which is arch based um, this is very very easy very very easy to do very very easy to learn um, so you're, you're you, first off you're probably gonna be you know, kind of scouring the internet you're gonna be going to uh, oh my god Ubuntu which is this web page here to learn about new software and kind of um, um, find things that you might not know about um, but would want to use this is a good place to go. So you're going to go to this web page and like like in this case, this sounds cool to me, this ambient noise player. Okay, how do you install it? You're going to do a PPA. What a PPA is, is it's a personal package archive. So I've explained about Aptitude. That's the, the package repository and, and, and package system and all that uh, uh, Debian and everything that's, that's shot off of it, that's forked from it. Ubuntu included uses. There's certain things, certain programs that are on that natively, that, that are on that by default. But not everything that's available in the big wide world of computers and the big wide world of Linux is on there. Um, so in order to get software that's not on there, you have the PPA that you can do in Ubuntu and all of the other things that have shot off from it and PPA is personal package archive so 
In this case, I'm going to need to add a personal package archive so that I can install this program because it's not on apt-get. Okay, not not uh, not natively. I'm going to have to add this as a personal package archive. I'm going to have to add this this in, into the repository and in, into my package repository on my on my machine. So, you see these commands here. I'm going to highlight them in the browser. Those are the commands. Okay, those are the commands. Now you can you can you can right click or uh, uh, hold left left click and drag. Right click, copy, and you can come in here. I'm going to put this as, as, as a corner, I'm going to corner fill that, and I can do paste. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually type it out because I want you to understand, you know, kind of do, do this a little bit more slowly and kind of explain and that kind of thing. So you're probably going to want to do right, you know, copy and paste basically. You know, you're, you're going to want to copy and paste. Uh, just like I just showed you, but I'm going to type it out. So you have sudo already entered in here. I've already got that entered in. So you do sudo. Again, what does that do? That tells the system, hey, I'm wanting to make a change. I'm the actually, I'm actually the user. I'm not a hacker. I'm not on some remote location in Russia or something somewhere wanting to do something nefarious. It's actually me. Hey, hey, I'm, I'll even enter my password. And you're going to have to do that. So you do sudo add apt repository and you always want to make sure that you've spelled everything right because even though generally speaking if you spell it wrong it just won't do anything there is I guess uh, possibly a chance that with some commands if you spelled it a little wrong um, it could you know do some really bad things so always be sure you spell it right sudo add apt repository I didn't spell suppository I spelled repository yes okay so that's saying I'm getting ready to add uh, my own uh, package repository through the PPA system. So, and this this next part here is the PPA. This is actually the PPA URL. So, PPA or the or the PPA locate location. How do you want Cost costalis forward slash a noise. And I'm going to hit enter. Now it says more info HTTPS and it gives the location, it gives the entire full URL. It says press enter to continue, continue or control C to cancel adding it. More than likely, if you've gone to the trouble of putting that line in there, saying sudo add apt repository and PPA and all that, is this is it's not an accident usually. And so you're going to want to just hit enter. So you hit enter when you get the prompt, and it adds all of that in, and it gives you all of the information about okay here's how we've added it you don't really need to pay too much attention to that now your system remember sudo apt get update and all that your system does not know that that's there yet so you're gonna have to update apt okay so that apt knows to pull from that PPA now you see here they've done this structure to sudo apt get update space ampersand ampersand space sudo apt get install a noise you can do it that way you can do that in all one line if you put and and or, or ampersand ampersand uh, not and and not no, no, not typing out and and but ampersand ampersand you can do it that way if you type it in exactly that way you can do that that's fine I personally don't do it that way unless I'm copying and pasting but I'm not going to copy and paste for you because I'm trying to teach you so we're going to do this this way. We're going to split that up. We're not going to do ampersand ampersand. We're going to split that up because that's, what that's doing is that's tying in two commands, the, the, the double ampersand. It's tying in two commands into one line, which is perfectly fine to do, but I want to explain to you what goes on. So sudo, again, all of these commands need sudo, okay, because you're making changes to your system, so they're going to need sudo. But you're not going to get prompted each and every single time you enter a command because there's a timeout and that timeout is different you can actually change it too if you want to I'm not going to get into how to do that because I don't want you doing that as a beginner I don't want you doing that but there's a time limit so say five minutes so all the commands that you enter in as long as they haven't had a five minute gap between them you only need to enter in your password once okay but if I were to enter it in and then I were to go and I were to take a, a you know, go to the bathroom to take a, a bowel movement or eat dinner or something and then I come back and then I enter well the timeout is passed and 
I'm going to have to enter in my password again. So if you don't see your your password prompt after each command, don't worry about it. It's just because you're within that timeout period. And that's fine. So sudo apt get update. Okay, which is going to do what? It's going to send what I've got on my computer to the server and it's going to want to compare and contrast what's there and all that. So sudo apt get update. And it's going and it's saying, okay, what all is available? And it's adding in because see here again it's also saying okay we've got something new now so it's added that in so now my computer will know that it can pull from this PPA and the URL that was attached to it that you saw when you added it now I can do sudo apt get install because I'm installing a program now and it now knows that whether where the location is to get it from and the program is a noise in this case so I'm installing this program and I'm going to hit enter so it's sudo apt get you're, you're telling aptitude to do something what are you telling aptitude to do you're telling it to install what are you telling it to install a noise and you're going to hit enter and then it tells you the following package will be, packages will be installed always pay attention to this never take this for granted a noise hyphen media that's the per that's that's the program, but then it'll also install some dependencies here. So it's going to install uh, GUR 1.2, and I'll you know I I say these things differently from some, some, some from some people. Uh, hyphen G streamer, so it's going to install G streamer. We know it's going to install this this Python package. That's fine. Suggested packages, blah 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 blah. So it's installing all of these, and that I don't see anything there that looks problematic to me. That's one thing that as you as you get to use in Linux, sometimes as you, this is just something that's going to just come with experience. Sometimes you'll spot something in there and you'll go, um, I don't want that because it's going to want to pull all those dependencies in. And as you use Linux, you'll know, okay, well, this may cause a problem with this. This may cause a problem with this other thing. Um, maybe you tried to install something before and it needed that dependency too, and it wouldn't. It actually wouldn't install because there was another satisfied dependency for that dependency that wasn't satisfied, etc., etc. That's something that you will just learn with experience. You know, I know, for example, what GStreamer is. I've seen this before. So, you know, I don't see anything in there that looks like it's going to be a problem. I don't see any versions that look like they're going to be a problem. So we're going to hit Y. Just punch the Y key on your keyboard and then hit Enter. Tell it to go on ahead and install that. And then you just give it a minute. You can see the download speed, and you can see the time that it will take. I don't think this will actually take 12 minutes. I hope it won't. It may, but I really hope it doesn't. While that's doing that, because I can continue to show other things, even if it does take 13 minutes, which I hope it doesn't. Um, we're at an hour and 17 minutes, and we still have a few things that we need to show. Hmm. Um, that's pretty straightforward. That also gets into the sudo apt update, you know, sudo apt get update, sudo apt get install. You're going to want to know those things. Again, even though you can use your software updater, you're still going to want to know how to do some of these terminal commands. You can't do this through software updater at all. Okay, you can't, that, that, if you're wanting to add a PPA, you're going to want to do that through the terminal. So you're going to need to know some terminal commands. Uh, as far as remember what I was talking about about community, and I'm going to probably want to install that too, but I may not do that on video because I, I won't need to because I've just shown you how to do it in the other one. And I also don't want to take up any more time than absolutely necessary. But, and you can see though, compare this with this. It's virtually identical in terms of the format. The only thing that changes is the PPA and the program that you're installing which makes sense. But the, the overall command of sudo add, add apt repository strung, strung together like that with hyphens between add apt repository, that's going to be the same. The PPA colon is always going to be the same. What follows it will change because it's going to be a different PPA. That will change. 
you can string these two commands. These are two commands, two separate commands. sudo apt get update. You see sudo apt get update here. That's one command. sudo apt get install VLC is a different command. You can string them to the two of them together with ampersand ampersand, but I just didn't do that because I was trying to show you that they're two commands. They're two separate commands. Um, but when you enter in in as one line, you'll only need to, if you need to at all, you'll only need to enter in your password once. So anyway, um, I just want to show you that you know, as you can compare the two, that that, that that this isn't unique in some way. That's always going to be how you're going to how you're going to add a PPA. And you see, it also didn't take quite as long as it was expecting either. Now, this is just me. This is just me personally. You see. It, those are the only commands that it gives you to do and then you're done. Um, for me personally, after I've installed a, 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 a package, I also still like to do sudo apt get update after the install and then do sudo apt get upgrade just on the off chance that there's an upgrade or something like that that has come in after that was added like onto a server or whatever. It's just it's just something that I do to be sure that everything's current and that there's that there's no conflicts or anything like that. That's just me. <clears throat> okay, and there's not, and and we're good. So that explains that. Well, what I was talking about about community. Um, this is important. Um, we go to. Well, I don't see any easy way of getting to it. You'll have to go into your browser. And it's entirely possible. When Firefox installs, now I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get out I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna use the fire the default Firefox install. Okay. When your system first installs, you'll, you'll actually have an icon here. Instead of the nightly web browser, you'll have Firefox proper, just plain on Firefox. And you also see that that program that we just installed popped up right there. You know, we just installed that. And I don't know if you can hear it or not, but I hear ambient noise. It sounds like a coffee shop. Yep, exactly. It's a coffee shop. Uh, that's really annoying. Wow, that's annoying. How do I get out of that? Well, I don't know one surefire way of getting rid of it. Wow, that's annoying. This is annoying as all hell. I don't even see. Wow, that's bizarre. One thing I guess I could do. There we go, that'll work. I don't know if you guys could hear that or not. <laughs> I wish I hadn't installed that, but it was a good example. It was the only reason why I was really installing it to start with. So anyway, uh, and I totally lost my train of thought. I don't know how that's supposed to help anybody. Oh, that's right, Firefox. Duh. Okay, so you'll you'll go to Firefox proper, and this will be pinned, um, or I should say locked, in, 
in, in Windows, you would call it pinning to the taskbar, but this would be locked um, to the... Uh, yes, please leave that closed. It would be locked here, and it would be up here somewhere. It would be, it would be prominent. You would see it. Um, what you'll find is... About to sneeze. Hang on. What you'll find is up here on, under your bookmarks. Uh, you have the Ubuntu and free software links. This is all default. And you have the Ubuntu, the Ubuntu wiki, Ubuntu. Um, all of these these uh, here these links you can go to Ubuntu and this is just www.ubuntu.com this is also where you will download it from too uh, it, when you're wanting to download it you'll just go to desk or uh, pardon me download and then it has different versions uh, more than likely, you're going to just want to click Ubuntu Desktop and choose 64-bit or 32-bit. Now, to explain this, uh, this will depend on what your processor is able to do. Most newer computers that have been, that, you know, if you've bought your computer in the last two, three, four years, it's almost guaranteed that it's a 64-bit computer. If your computer has more than four gigabytes of RAM, it's almost it's in fact it is guaranteed that if your computer has more than four gigabytes of RAM, it's a 64-bit computer. I, I would guarantee that because you can't use more than four gigabytes of RAM unless you're using a 64-bit operating system. So when you know when you look in in, in your uh, system uh, information and you see oh I've got eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes or 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 just four gigabytes, you know yeah okay it's it's 64-bit so you would want to download the 64-bit version if your computer is older or has less than uh, uh, they say less than two gigabytes of RAM and I would say yeah definitely if it has less than two, two gigabytes of RAM it's probably going to be 32-bit uh, and you would want to download the 32-bit version so pay attention to that but that's, that's how you would download it is you would go to the Ubuntu website and you would go down to uh, download and you would just click download and it would take you here now Oh, and you also see that there's two versions. 14.04. Now let me explain this too. 1404 is an LTS. LTS means long-term support. You see right there, long-term support. That's probably what most people would would want to download, particularly if they don't feel real real confident yet. Um, that's probably what you would want to go with. You're 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 more assured that the system's going to be stable and so on with that than you would be with a newer version. 1504 is the newest version. Um, but at any rate, no matter which one you choose, that's where you would go to do it. Okay. And remember, 1404, this is the 14th version. It was released in April. When was it released? Last April. 1504 was released. 15, 15th version, it was released in April, too. When was, what April was it released in? It was released this April. Okay. So, anyway. Uh, but you see up here, up here at the top, you see Ubuntu community ask developer design so on so on so on and so forth what's more canonical you don't need any of that help you don't need any of that so you have the community ubuntu.com um, ask now this is where you're going to want to go and and you'll want to bookmark this too probably if you're serious about getting into Ubuntu and this is going to be your operating system and so on if you have any questions this is probably going to be where you're wanting to go because this is what and this is what I mean by community the whole community is asking questions and answering questions and all that if you go to ask dot or uh, excuse me ask Ubuntu dot com you're going to be able to get your question answered if you Google so if I Google, um, how do I remove a program in Ubuntu? If you Google this, where is it going to take you? Well, it'll take you to How To Geek, but it will also take you to AskUbuntu.com and to a question. Sure enough, somebody in Ask Ubuntu has asked that question, and this is where you'll find your answers. You see, see, 
this is the question. Are there various ways to uninstall items? Which ways always work? How come you blah, 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 blah. It says if the application has been installed via the package manager, all you have to do is run sudo app get remove application name. And you'll see the little green arrow, or a uh, arrow, the little, the little green circle with a check mark in it signifies that that's an actual an, an actually a good answer um, it signifies that any any that have green uh, those little green circles with the check marks and all that's probably also going to be the best answer you'll see that there's plenty of other answers but that's the answer that's been certified basically by by Ubuntu or by the by, by the community at large that kind of thing it's the answer that best answered this person's question and, and so on. And so you can, you, you, when you're in askubuntu.com, you can search up here for any of the problems that you're having. So that's what I meant earlier by community too. Is that pretty much any error that you have, um, any question that you have about how to do something, will be explained there. And the other thing that you can do too is when you're installing the system and so on, and, and, and if you want an Ubuntu account, and all that. Um, I'm not sure if you can get to it through here or not, but uh, I know you can create it. You can actually create accounts in here. It's just, you know in Stack Exchange, you can actually create an account. Um, and pardon me for a moment while I figure out. Yeah, so that's where I would log into my account. What I'm showing you here about this, and you can even sign up using Facebook. I mean, I'm posting the link to these videos in Facebook, so I know all all of the people watching this video have Facebook. Sign in using Facebook, no problem. And you can also sign up for the Ask Ubuntu newsletter. And I think it comes out once a week, I believe. I think it's a weekly newsletter. Um, and you will also see some of the top questions that 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 the community at large. As, as said, these are these are these are either, either current problems that that people are working on and people have found a solution to, or they're they're the best questions in terms of um, helping the, the greatest number of people um, that have been posed recently. That that kind of thing. So community, okay, and you can see the URL ask askubuntu.com. You're going to go up to to sign up. And you're going to sign up however you want to sign up, and you click sign up. It's that simple. That's community that doesn't exist really in Microsoft, doesn't exist really in proprietary software. You're going to find plenty of people that will help you, and and explain things to you, and walk you through problems that you're having, and all the rest. It's not. It, there's no reason to be scared of Linux, and there's certainly no reason to be scared of using a Linux operating system, particularly if the operating system you've chosen is Ubuntu. Uh, again, there's a reason why I'm starting my beginners out, um, you know, my, my beginning videos and, and all of that out on Ubuntu, is because I think that's going to be the one that um, is, is, it's the one I started on, because it's the easiest to start out on. PPAs, um, sudo apt get and all that that's that's so easy it's so simple it's about as simple as you can get with Linux eventually we'll be moving into Arch okay Arch is a little bit more um, difficult to use only in the sense that the commands are different from 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 sudo apt get and so on you don't have a software you know you don't have in other words you don't have this this is the Ubuntu Software Center here. This is where you can add and remove software. Um, when you go into, when you first start your system, the first time after you've installed Ubuntu, this is where you're going to go. And if okay, I, I need a, um, a a desktop program, and there's the compatibility issue. I think I talked about this. In, I guess it was in what was it in the last video. This is where you would go, okay, to Office and all of that, and you would install. And you can see I've installed LibreOffice Writer here. I can tell it to remove it. I can go into More Info, and I can also click these check marks and add uh, extra things into it very easily that way. You don't have this with Arch. You don't have a software center with Arch or anything like that. You have to. Uh, what you will do is you will type in. This is with Arch now. Don't do this in in Ubuntu. I'm talking about a completely different 
structure, it's a completely different package structure on completely different distros. But it's it's cumbersome because it becomes I believe it's spelled that way Y A O yeah, Y A O Y A O U R T. You're using Yaurt with this. And then you would type in LibreOffice. And you would hit enter and then Yaurt is gonna pull a list similar to the, like this list that you would see here and in the list, in this big long list in the, in, in the terminal is going to be every single thing on Yow on, on Yowert or R or whatever it, whatever it is, I get confused by all those things um, you know R is A-U-R I think yeah, but anyway um, it's going to pull down every single package there that has LibreOffice in it. So you could see um, LibreOffice in the list, and then it'll give a number and that kind of thing. And it might be LibreOffice um, um, language pack or something like this. You'll have this huge list of stuff, and then you have to discern which one it is that you're actually wanting. So you can see how that's going to require a little bit more of an advanced skill set. You're going to have to be a little bit more familiar with Linux, in my opinion, to use uh, Arch or an Arch-based distro like the one I use, which is Antergos, than using Ubuntu. So I'm starting you off in this because this is going to be one of the easiest ones that you're going to ever find to use. It's It's a great way to begin with Linux and not have to worry all that much about massive system failures and crashes and package breakages and it's not going to be a headache in other words. Um, it's, a, it's a great one to start on. So we've gone over some basic terminal commands sudo apt-get update sudo apt-get upgrade we've gone over sudo uh, Oh, and another thing too is if you hit the up key, the up arrow on your um, keyboard, you get, and you just keep pressing it, you get a history of the commands that you've entered too, which I love. Um, so we've gone over sudo add apt repository and then your PPA. We've gone over all of that. Those are key skills that you're going to want to know. We've gone over. Um, Specifically with the with the Ubuntu, we've gone over the dash. Okay, remember, we've gone over and and again, how do we get to dash? We can we can give a left click up here on the dash icon. We can hit the start button on our keyboard. We've gone over that. <coughs> we've gone over uh, getting into the HUD, which we get into the HUD by hitting the Alt key on our keyboard on our keyboard. Remember that the, that the HUD um, is how you would either find commands because you may, maybe you don't know where they are, or it's a really really quick way of entering a command so that you don't break your workflow. Excellent, very powerful tool. We went in back to back to going to dash. We went into how to use these scopes, the use the, the Unity scopes. I showed you that. That's a really powerful tool. Um, keeps you from having, having to open up external browsers a lot of the times. Um, so we've gone over um, in either the last video or this one. Uh, we've gone over uh, software compatibility and how, even though you may not be able to run a Microsoft Windows program in Linux, there are going to be, in most cases, um, free software, open source programs that are equivalent, or in many cases, in many cases better for one reason or another. Um, so in other words, you know, word, your, your word processor, like I showed you, LibreOffice, word processor, you got LibreOffice. Um, you have Thunderbird, it's a really good one um, to use instead of um, Microsoft Office Outlook. So there's no you can use you can use Skype. You have to use, yeah, this is another case where I think you have to add a PPA, I believe, or, or you used to have to. Now, now, actually, in actual fact, let me get rid of the other Skype launcher, or uh, Skype launcher, the other uh, Firefox launcher. Now, in some cases, you used you used to have to add um, um, 
repositories and things like that in terminal. Now though, if I wanted to install Skype, this is relatively uh, this is a relatively recent development. I just go to skype.com and all that and I go to downloads. And now it, it detects automatically that I'm on Linux. Now I would go to this would be uh, 1204 multi arch. It may take it a second to. I don't know, do I need to hit enter? Yeah, I need to hit enter. So it's going to want to try and download it. And you see this. 430371i386, blah, 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 blah. I would save this file. And then I would go into my downloads folder by going into my file manager here, to the left there, file manager, downloads, and then I see this file. This is a .deb file. Now I already have Skype installed, so I'm not going to launch. I'm not. I'm not going to run this. But this is this is dead simple. And again, this is not like in the old days where you had to, you know compile from, from source and do tar balls and extract tar balls and all that. You, you, you know, this is dead simple. Okay, this is another advantage of using a Debian based system over some others. This you would just double click that. It's going to open up in Software Center. Software Center is going to say, hey, this is a third party deal, yada yada yada, do you want to do the thing and, 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 and all that. It's going to ask you to enter your password, and you're going to hit enter, and it's just going to install it same, basically the same as it would if it were actually in the software center. Dead simple, easy, easy, easy. You didn't used to have that. It used to be that you had to add in all kinds of. Um, you either had to, you either had to to uh, install it from a tarball, which is not too difficult, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt, you know. Um, or you had to do it through um, adding a, a PPA and things like that. Now, uh, Google Chrome is the same way. So you're, you're not going to come. It that doesn't come with Chrome. It comes with Firefox. It may come with Chromium. I can't remember. Um, but I know it comes with Firefox. And I think Chromium may, may actually be one that you have to uh, pull up off of uh, the Ubuntu Software Center there. But so let's say I wanted to install Google Chrome. Uh, Google Chrome is the one that I use the, the most often. But Firefox, I know I haven't don't have any bookmarks or anything in, in, in so it's clean in that sense though it's not going to be um, distracting people because you know I've, I've configured it and all so it, it'll look more like what your system's going to look like fresh so let's say I decide oh, I want to install uh, Chrome um, so I would, I would Google just Google Chrome ah no not Chrome 4 well it took me there anyway I'm going to hit Google, you know, hit hit the hit the go to, go to the page here, and I'm going to go to download. When we get to the download, it again detects what I'm what my operating system is. Uh, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, blah 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 blah. Det detects I'm in Linux, and I would click download, and then I have these options here. I'm using a 64, but you always want to try try to match. Um, the program's architecture with the architecture of the operating system that you're using for all intents and purposes. So we're using 60. I, I, I personally have a 64-bit or, or, or you know 60, 60, 60. Is it 64-bit? How do you? I guess you'd say 64-bit. I'm using a 64-bit processor, 64-bit operating system. So it's 64, 64. So in my case, I would choose the 64-bit. Dot deb because it's a set, it says right here for Debian Ubuntu. If I were using Fedora or OpenSUSE, I would use an RPM. That's that's their package structure. Okay, so in 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 um, uh, in Arch, you're using Pacman, you're using RPM and Fedora, and you're using dot deb and Debian Ubuntu and and other associated distros. So I would select 64-bit dot deb package accept install it's going to download I'm going to go back into my downloads folder here in my file manager I would click double click the icon it's going to bring it up in Ubuntu Software Center and I'm going to install it and I'm going to have Chrome
as you see, I've already done that because I have Chrome here. You know, so that's dead simple. And those are really all the skills you need. You need you need to know a few terminal commands. You need to understand where you're going to find your programs. So that means you're going to need to understand. Um, you're, need, you're going to need to understand the launcher, or uh, excuse me, the dash here, which is at the top left of the launcher. Uh, you're going to need to understand your HUD. Um, that's really it. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's really it. Um, let's see, is there any, is there anything else? You're, you know, this is where you would log out. I think I touched on that all already. Panel. I told you how. To, I believe I, I told you how. Um, I don't think it was in the video that crashed. I think uh, I think I showed you how you can change your desktop backgrounds and all that. So those are all the skills you need for using um, Ubuntu Linux. In subsequent videos, I'm going to show other desktop environments, and you will understand. And I'll I'll reiterate this when I actually get to those videos. You will understand that those desktop environments are available on all of the other platforms. So you can get. Uh, uh, for example, KDE desktop environment, you can get in Arch, you can get KDE on Ubuntu, you can get it on Debian, you can get it on Fedora, I, believe, I think even. You can get these other desktop environments on Ubuntu, but the default, the, you know, the, the native, whatever, you, however you want to think of it, the default desktop environment in Ubuntu is this which you're seeing right now, which is Unity 7. And when we get into KDE and Cinnamon and some of these others, I'm going to be showing it to you on Arch, but again, understand you can get this on Ubuntu if you if you decide that you like Ubuntu and Ubuntu work, works for you and it's, you know, because it's simpler and so on, you want to stick to Ubuntu, you can get these other desktop environments. But going forward, you're going to need to understand some of these core skills. You're going to need to be comfortable with the idea of working in a terminal and you're going to need to uh, understand the concept of installing software using a terminal versus installing software using a helper like um, the Ubuntu Software Center. Uh, because again the software that you're installing in the Ubuntu Software Center is also available for you to install through a terminal command too, but not all of the software that's available for you to install is available in the in the Software Center. So you're going to need to be comfortable with the idea of using a terminal to install something uh, going forward, because some of the things that we're going to be that we're going to be dealing with in subsequent videos are going to be building on the skills that I've taught you in in both this video and in the beginning Windows video just like the beginning Windows video has skills that you need to already understand and 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 be competent with to understand how to start with Linux if you don't understand how to use the mouse and all that I didn't cover that in this so you need to go back to that you need to watch that and get familiar with that before you move to that before we move on so going forward you're going to need to be be comfortable with the skills that I've showed you here to be comfortable going on into okay how do I install a new desktop environment and there's no point in pick, picking a desktop environment that you think you would like best if if you can't install it because the only way of installing it is to install through the terminal so it's just it's just it's just a question of building on skills and so that's all there really is to Linux. It's it's real simple, real easy to use. Uh, it's incredibly secure. It's been recommended by uh, government security agencies. You know, uh, the British equivalent of the NSA, um, maybe even the NSA here, recommends Linux. It's been, and the one that they recommend above all all else because it's of its ease of use and so on is Ubuntu. And there's a reason for that. It's more secure than Windows is. And that's the, I mean, that's the primary reason. So we, you know, I've, I've explained the security aspect and all of that in the first video, and I've shown you how to use Ubuntu in this video. And going forward, we're going to really start to delve in a little bit more into into Linux. And um, by the time I've gotten done doing all of the Linux videos, um, I don't think that there's anybody in the world that that would 
have any kind of an issue using it. You you'll you'll get to by the you'll get to the point where by the end of it, uh, by the end of all these all of these videos on Linux, you'll be as comfortable using Linux even though you may have never have used it before, may never have even seen it before or heard of it before. You'll be as comfortable using that as you ha as you as you are using Windows if you've been using Windows all your life. So, um, but practice these skills, and if if you're not sure about whether or not you want to try Linux, the easiest thing to do is either create a live bootable USB and boot into the USB, or using an ISO image, burn it to a CD and boot to the CD and you can actually try it without having to actually install it. And uh, and that'll also be another way for you to practice and kind of get familiar with it too. And I may be able to show you how to do a, a how to create a bootable USB and so on and I may do a short video. It won't be any more than like five minutes long on how to do that. But um, so regardless think about it decide if uh, you think that uh, Linux might be right for you and if you decide that it is wait until we get through all of the series of videos and you see all the different desktop environments and and, and get to where you're comfortable with some of the ideas that you know okay things are going to be different than what you're used to and um, by the time you get done with all of the all the different videos I don't think that, the, that there's going to be any doubt in your mind um, that it's going to be something that you can tackle. It's not anything that that, that there's any cause to be um, skittish about. Because I have known people that the idea, the, the the perception that a lot of people have that that have heard of Linux is, is that you have to be some sort of hacker, some sort of computer genius. You have to know how to program to use Linux. That's not true. That's what I'm trying to dispel with these videos. And I think that this is a this is a going to be a an ideal operating system for a lot of people, particular older people that, that are on fixed incomes or don't want to have to fool with the hassle of, of the risk of having viruses and things that exist with Windows, I think that Linux would be a good fit for a lot of people. So um, I want to be sure that, that some of the myths about Linux and how complicated it is are dispelled, and I want to be sure that by the time I've gotten done with this series of videos that uh, the people that have watched the videos are, are going to be—they're going to be certain that they can that they can handle Linux, and they're going to see all that there is to see regarding Linux. Everything that they're going to need to know, they're going to know. So anyway, um, that's that's beginning with Linux, specifically Ubuntu, and um, going forward, I'll I'll touch on some of the other desktop environments, and that'll probably be coming up in the next few days.